Okay. Um, thank you. I, we, we can use the microphone for, for the question period if you'd like. I mean, I do have some, some cards here, which I, I'll, uh, I can certainly get us started, but a couple of things. Um, last weekend, I was um, wanting to visit my daughter for Easter, who lives in Ottawa, and uh, because she couldn't come for, for Easter. And so I said, let's go and have dinner uh, together, and I'll come either on Saturday or, or Sunday. And she said to me, this is all text, and she said to me, well, Saturday's 420. I said, my, and then I said, what's 420? And then the next text was, mom, dot, dot, dot. And I said, well, what is it? So she told me that the 420 is part of the marijuana culture, and because this was, and this is where kids in um, California, and in, I think it was in San Rafael High School, at 420 every day, they would go and smoke pot by... Um, the the stature actually of Louis Pasteur, and that because to this year was the first year that cannabis legal cannabis or cannabis was legal, uh, she was going to um, Parliament Hill to smoke up. So my God, I said, th times have changed, haven't they? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start to ask Laura Lee with her experience uh, with um, her use of cannabis. Cannab blah, I can't say that word. Cannabis oil. So Laura Lee, over to you. Sativex. So um, I'm a person that cannot take opioids, which is, you know, um, a good thing in the sense with the crisis that's going on, but a very bad thing when you're trying to control pain. And for me, the biggest problem was at night having a good restful restorative sleep at night because I was constantly shifting and tossing and turning because of bone pain. So um, opioids keep me awake. So I went, I cycled through everything until finally one kept me awake for 29 hours. And I said, okay, that's it, no more, this has to stop. And uh, I asked about um, cannabinoids and uh, my, my GP was very reluctant at first. <coughs> he said, let me check into it. And it just happened to coincide with him being able to prescribe Sativex and being able to get it through my own, my own pharmacy. So. Um, and having it covered on my drug plan. I had to get a special approval on my drug plan as well. He had to show the evidence of all of the things I had cycled through to try and control pain. So um, I, have, I can honestly say that since being on it, the quality of my sleep is so much better, so much more restorative. I do take it in combination with a sleeping pill. Um, but when I travel, I can't take it. I mean, I can travel within Canada, yes, but when I go down to Arizona to see my mom and dad for, Chris, uh, for a couple of weeks in the winter, I get to be awake for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, I just wanted to share that because okay. it is definitely worth exploring. You know what, um, it's a spray. So it's a, a spray that I put under my tongue and I do three sprays a night. That's it. I don't use it during the day because it does cause a little bit of fuzziness. And I'm working. So I think it's probably not appropriate for me to be driving to work or spraying at work. So, Dr. Verbora, do you have any comments to add to? Um, yeah, so testimony? just Sativex is a one-to-one. -one, so it's got CBD and it's got THC. Um, I would just say that I would look into whether you could go across the border with it, because I've been telling people they can. Um, <laughs> and so, so because Sativex actually has a drug identification number, this is the hypocrisy of the system. Um, it is the plant material, but it's a, like an FDA-approved drug identification number product. So, uh, like I think you're allowed. I think you're allowed to go across the border, to my knowledge. Same with like Nabilone, which is a prescription. Oh, some people have comments here. Absolutely not. No. Interesting. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to look into that further. The flower, yeah. yes, the flower and the cannabis oils from the cannabis companies you can definitely not travel with, but the Sativex is a pharmaceutical that's also approved for use in the U.S. And so it has a drug identification number. I've had many people cross the border with it without questions whether it's legal or not. I don't know. I have to look into that. Excuse okay. me, please. Could we use the microphone? Yep. Oh, we have a border patrol person here. So Sativex. What about Nabilone, the prescription Nabilone? What about prescription fentanyl? 
Fentanyl can't cross the border? Okay, okay, but you have a prescription for Nabilone, you have a prescription for Sativex, why can't they cross the border? It's a prescription. It's not herbal cannabis, I'm confused. Yeah. This is, this is the wild, wild west. So we're learning as we go, yeah. that's for sure. Okay. Um, I have a, um, a question for, I guess, again, Dr. Verbora. Can uh, CBD cause insomnia? I think you, you mentioned it, but can you elaborate? Yeah, so, so CBD has a biphasic effect as well. What we see is that at low doses of CBD, and what's a low dose? It's, you know, it might be 10, 20 milligrams of CBD. That's usually energizing. People will report that I get a little bit of energy with low doses of CBD. As you start to use higher and higher doses, what's a high dose? 50, 60 milligrams maybe, people will report that they feel a little bit tired, a little bit fatigued. And so it's again, it's a dose dependent response. Um, so it depends on the dose. Good, thank you. Got a question here for uh, Dr. Luzada. Um, if someone's on Revlimid in aspirin maintenance and has to travel overseas, should they change their doses of aspirin? Um, maybe related to travel in an airplane, I would think, because the, the next question is, speaks to compression socks and should they be used? for long flights? Yeah, so for long flights, we don't recommend any changes. Um, before, when I started my training in thrombosis, the recommendation is that patients that had blood clots would all get a little injection um, of blood thinner before they went on their flights, but that dropped. This is not done anymore. And if you didn't have any blood clots, even if you're on Revlimid, you can travel you do continue with your baby aspirin, you wear your compression stockings, you walk around every couple of hours if you can, otherwise if you cannot walk around because you're having turbulence or something, um, what you're gonna do is do calf muscle exercises to keep the blood flowing, drink lots of water, avoid alcoholic beverages before, during the flight, or the long car ride, but you don't need to um, increase the dose of aspirin or change medication for that. Thank you. Um, these, there's two questions here about interactions with CBD, and I guess it's with Dr. Verbora. Uh, Verbora. Um, do they, does CBD interact with drugs like statins, for example? And I have a follow-up question on, on drug interactions. Yeah, so we don't have all the answers with the interactions. The, the National Health Services has a big document they put out recently that shows all the potential drug interactions. Um, with cannabinoids, but they're all theoretical, so we really don't know. There's very few case studies. The ones that I worry about in my practice are warfarin, uh, just because warfarin interacts with everything you feel like, and so I always just tell people to monitor their INR level if they're starting cannabinoids. Um, and then the other one that I worry about um, is like uh, anti-epileptic drugs, like clobazam. Um, that one interacts with, with CBD specifically. So the truth is we don't have all the answers. Now, when we start people on cannabinoids, we start at a low dose and we slowly build it up and then they get to a therapeutic dose. So the question is, is even if there is an interaction, it might be kind of accounted for as we're titrating because if you have twice the levels in your blood, you're just gonna take half the dose that someone else uses or if it was metabolizing faster, you may just take double the dose. And so that's kind of the caveat with our approach with cannabinoids is we might not capture the interactions because of that titration. How about with interaction with um, cancer medication or chemotherapies? <clears throat> So I haven't, like I usually, I always advise patients if you're doing chemo, always speak to the pharmacy team and, and to your oncologist and who, whoever's part of your team just to double check and make sure because I do not know all of the different chemotherapy drugs out there by far. Um, and there seems to be like a new one every week, truthfully. Um, and so you should always ask. To the best of my knowledge, it usually doesn't interact. If there is a worry, sometimes I'll say, you know, if there's a real concern or anxiety around it, like dose it three, four hours before, um, and then again, just double check with the people that are administrating the drug who have a better understanding of how it's metabolized. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you please take the microphone because we need to... Um... Yeah, without the mic, uh, the video can't hear your question. Yeah. Wait, it'll be on in a second. Hello, oh, okay. Um, just, yeah, follow up to the question about interactions and the cancer medications. So one of your slides had mentioned um, an antioxidant effect with the mm -hmm. cannabinoids. So 
A lot of the drugs we use for myeloma, we actually recommend against the use of antioxidants because it can reduce the efficacy of some of these medications. Can you comment on that at all? Or? Yeah, so I think the, the, the slide you're probably looking at is, is the complicated slide with all the different uh, chemical properties of cannabinoids. So they, cannabinoids are known to, as a basic science principle that they have some antioxidant effects. I don't know how much antioxidative effects are there. I don't know what doses, which different cannabinoids produce. Um, so theoretically, that would be an issue. I just I, there's no way for me to quantify uh, if that would be a barrier to using uh, chemotherapy or not. Can I can I uh, follow up again on that very complicated slide? I'm the nurse practitioner with my myeloma program at the Princess Margaret, and I am the go-to girl for cannabis products. All the docs refer the patients to me because I think it has great things. But one of the, on that very complicated slide, it said that uh, CBD can be immunosuppressive. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so, so that was in the World Health Organization report on CBD. There's a 30-page document online you can download. And so we don't understand, but some of the preliminary evidence, which is not high quality, shows that at certain doses it might be immunosuppressive CBD, and at certain do doses um, it might be like immunostimulant. And so this is just very, very preliminary basic science research. And again, unfortunately, like I'm always going to give you the same answer, sadly. It's like we, we need to learn more. Um, so it definitely works on the immune system. CBD is boosting your body's own endogenous cannabinoids, which then bind to those CB2 receptors in the immune system. But what is it doing? I don't know. Michael, while I've got the mic, um, one other question. You spoke about uh, obviously not smoking cannabis, but that you recommend vaping. Mm -hmm. Now, myeloma patients, their immune system is compromised even when they're doing well. <laughs> And I have always understood that even with vaping, we're still putting patients at risk for aspergillus. Um, so I, I don't, to my knowledge, that shouldn't be a risk. All the cannabis, so the biggest risk with inhaling cannabis would be if you had tainted cannabis that had like, if you're immunocompromised and you're smoking cannabis or vaping cannabis that has fungus on it or something, mm -hmm. then you could get a very bad fungal infection. There was a case in California in a dispensary because that's the real Wild West, not Canada, um, where there's no regulations. And someone got a fungal infection and died from a really mm. serious complication. Now, in Canada, all the cannabis is tested, uh, controlled by Health Canada. They go through testing. Um, and there's no other chemicals in the vapor. It's just the flower and the vaporizer. So I don't know where you would get something like that. Uh, you'd have to have uh, a breakdown in the checks and balances in the system. And, and, and globally around the world, I would say Canada has the single highest standards for cannabis quality control. So I have a question, sorry, just in that respect. So when we see people on, in the, str on the street with those vaporizers, is there cannabis always in there, or can yeah. they just vape, I don't know, <laughs> juice? Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. So most of those clouds, the, the ones with the really big clouds yeah. that you're oh, walking yeah. by that smell like berries and stuff, so that's tobacco vaporizing, and it has like e-juice, which is like a vegetable glycerin, and that can cause like uh, lung diseases, like boop, I think it is. Uh, I don't even know what that stands for anymore. But it can cause like popcorn lung or something. Um, so those have chemicals in it, but when you're vaping, um, the legal way of vaping cannabis is just the flower. So you're putting the raw flower into the machine, it's heating it up through convection or, or conduction, and you're just getting the vapor. Now, in six months, maybe there will be these vape pens that'll be in the market, it'll be a concentrated cannabis product. We don't know what the rules are for what chemicals are allowed with that yet. And so that's, there's a lot of illegal cannabis products on the market, like 70% of people using cannabis are still using illegal black market stuff. And so some of those vape devices might have it, but we have no idea what's in it because they're, they're not under any legal channel. A um, couple of questions here. How do you know or where do you go to make sure that you have a good uh, medical consultation on uh, cannabis? And how do, you, how do you know that you're paying the right price for it? And it's not like yeah. kind of yeah. So brazen. yeah, it's 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 not easy. You need to you need to know who's reputable and who has experience. Um, you know, um, it's tough. There's a lot of different clinics out there. There, the, the spectrum of quality 
um, is vastly, vastly different clinic to clinic. Like at our clinic, I'm fortunate enough that we have like a radiation oncologist that works with us. We have a psychiatrist that works with us. We have a pain doctor that works with us. And so we can kind of leverage all of our skills to kind of send the patients to the right doctor that has the best skill set to help them with cannabis use and their primary condition. Um, but yeah, it's really difficult. What we do at our clinics is, is once you see the physician, you see what's called an educator. And what the educator does is, is their job to like scan the whole market for patients and understand who's got a deal on what and how much is it going to cost and which one's organic and which one's grown by sunlight and which one's not. And these are variables that as a physician, it doesn't really matter to me because cannabis is usually cannabis and they're all under the same regime in terms of regulation. But to patients who are become consumers because they're buying it, these are variables that matter to them. So. I provide that service. It's an expensive service to provide that's not OHIP refundable, unfortunately. Um, but they try to help patients access the best products legally um, and give them options for accessing it. So talk to your doctor. We have a question over there. So we have a quite microphone over where <coughs> is it? Sorry, we had a question. What do you charge? Just, just wait. What do I charge? <laughs> Two brownies. <laughs> No, just kidding. Um, there's no charge to see a physician. There's no charge. It's an OHIP covered service. Yes. Yeah. So, so the consultation, there's no charge to see me. And I tell you if I think you should use it and you shouldn't use it. And I tell you which products you should use and how to take it. And then once, once I write an authorization for you, then you see someone who helps you access it legally. And then you pay that company. I, I got a question for Dr. Lozada. So don't pay anybody for that. Oh, question over here. Yeah, for Dr. Lozada. Yes. Um, I was diagnosed with an AVM before uh, the myeloma journey, whatever. So the the embolism, the DVT, and the uh, we're talking about embolism, right? That's your special thing. Is there an increase uh, risk of the AVM? It, no. it, do you, that that could be exacerbated by. No, uh, in myeloma? principle, your risk is actually of um, bleeding, mm -hmm. than than clotting. So the AVM is more bleeding than clotting. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, uh, should I be using, because I'm on the aspirin, the aspirin is more for artery, arterial? No, aspirin, being? well, in, gen in the general population, aspirin is very much used for prevention of arterial clots. So um, if you have cardiac problems, um, if you have angina, right, which is the chest pain, but it's not really a heart attack. If you have problems in the, artery, in the arteries of your legs, um, many times aspirin is recommended as a preventive measure. Um, for venous clots, aspirin also comforts protection, but it's not so great. In myeloma, the major indi indication for aspirin is use of len, palm, um, carfilzomib, and um, thalidomide. Although I have to say that nobody uses aspirin for carfilzomib, but if you read the product monograph, they put it. They put it because they do have a higher risk of um, cardiovascular events, including heart attack, stroke, hypertension, arrhythmias, which is funny heartbeats, um, blood clots in the lungs. So, so the aspirin should do okay for both the arterial and the veno? In principle, need... yes. There are other risk factors that we evaluate. So it depends on other drugs you're taking, if you are obese, um, if you had a recent surgery, those may be added risk factors. And then in that case, your doctor may suggest a stronger blood thinner than aspirin to be used. Thank you. I've got um, another question here. If someone is taking fentanyl to deal with pain, what would be the recommended dose of cannabis to reduce the fentanyl? Yeah, so there's no, uh, the thing with cannabis is a very personalized therapy. Um, we don't have data to say everybody needs 10 milligrams and your pain will be reduced by 30 points. And um, what we do is we have some capsules now that start at 2.5 milligrams of CBD and THC. And so that's like a starting dose. And then so I start people, no, no matter what you're on, I start you on the lowest dose I can find and the highest amount of CBD. We try it until we get to a threshold that I think it's, if it's not effective at that point, you shouldn't spend any more money and then we should try a different product. And so it's like a brute force, like there's, 
there's very little unfortunate science around it. It's let's go through this product, see how you do. If it doesn't work, let's go through this product, see how you do, and we'll just do so cautiously and measure your effects. And I probably have about three or four patients that have come off completely off fentanyl, and it's very, very difficult. Um, and I've had many, many reduce their dose, um, but it takes months and months and, and potentially even years, depending how long you've been on opioids to really reduce it. And I, I go very, very slowly and cautiously because I'd rather get success at the end of the line than be too aggressive and have setbacks. Yeah, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily work with everybody, right? And, and so I know we've probably talked a lot about opioids and how bad they are, but they're also really good in certain instances as well. So I don't want to 100% discredit opioids. Like they can be very, very effective for incidental pain um, and for other situations where they can be very effective. And sometimes they work better than cannabinoids. And so it's not all evil. Um, question for you again, is CBD from marijuana uh, different from CBD from hemp? So yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so they're, they're identical uh, ingredients, right? So CBD from hemp, which just looks and grows just like cannabis, <clears throat> um, but mainly it's used for like textiles and, and, and the question is, is this gonna replace the plastics that we have and everything? Um, and so CBD from the hemp, um, you have to use a lot of hemp to isolate the CBD, but it doesn't have all the same terpenes and flavonoids. That slide I talked about, all the different cannabinoids, it has no THC or, or, or it's pretty much no THC in hemp. The CBD from a cannabis flower always has a small dose of THC, a very micro dose, I would call it, and it has the other terpenes and flavonoids. So in my experience and some of the research, it shows that using the cannabis extract over a hemp extract, the CBD and the, the cannabis extract works better. And that's just been done in like um, uh, seizures is, is the study. Thank you. Got a question for you, uh, Dr. Luzada. When taking Revlimib or Pomalist is on, when, is on hold for, for whatever reason, does a patient con need to continue to take blood thinner? That's an excellent question, and I don't think there's a right answer. So I will tell you what we usually do with our with our with our patients with other with other cancers. Um, we tend to continue for another month or so. So um, if you stop your Revlimid, take an extra month of aspirin, and then stop. It's like if you're taking <coughs> bortezomib. If you're using bortezomib. After you complete your cycles with bortezomib, you usually continue with your acyclovir for shingles prevention for an extra month. So it's just that extra protective measure because, because, because blood clots are formed by proteins that are in your blood. If those proteins are activated and you just finished your Revlimid, you want to make sure those proteins deactivate, right, because that stimulant is gone, so you give it another Empiric 30 days, so another 30 days, and then you stop it. Okay. Um, this question is uh, for Dr. Verbora. Can cannabis have an effect on libido, either positive or negative? Yeah, so, um, so the old message used to be um, that cannabis affected sperm and decreased libido, and that was the old messaging and, and, and the old research. Um, but there's actually just a study, it was in, done in men that demonstrated that uh, men who use cannabis actually had a 30% increase in testosterone levels. Um, and it was a small study, it was only 30 to 50 patients. Um, anecdotally, um, the, the people that are coming into my clinic are telling me that their libido has increased uh, substantially. And there are actually products marketed to the females um, there are like uh, topical oils that you can use uh, vaginally or rectally, uh, either or for stimulation or for potentially pain. I have no idea if they work, but they're being marketed as such. Truthfully, there's just no studies. Uh, and I just have like three or four patients that claim benefit, but that's all I can hang my hat on, unfortunately. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, we have time maybe for one question. Is, that, is there like somebody has a burning question that was not asked in, the, in that um, in today? Good, I think we, we exhausted um, a lot of your, your time and energy and brain cells, and certainly mine anyway. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over uh, to David, who is gonna close the day.